Nick and Trelik have everything going here. So the campus tour over to Michigan is only two weeks. We'll leave two weeks from today, and that's coming up quickly. Amen? So if you're interested in being involved in that trip, you need to um, talk to me about that um, or see Matthew, but he just left for vacation for the next two weekends, so forget that, right? <laughs> so just see me, and um, we can get you squared away. There's also these newspapers out on the table for all of you to take. If you'd like to take one, I'm going to throw this over there. Um, so have you noticed the nation is collapsing? It didn't just start. <laughs> the fissures have been in the foundation for a long time, and the, and the rule of law has been crumbling to the ground for many decades. But it's really, really crazy at this point. New York City just voted that illegal aliens can vote. That's about 750,000 people in their city can vote. Only in county and local elections, mind you. Um, but that's something that's being pushed around the country. And now that New York's done it, you'll see more and more of it take place. If you think that won't help them regarding other elections, too, at the state and federal level, you're living in a fantasy land. <laughs> It'll help them all vote in those elections, too. Um, a federal judge ruled that illegal aliens just this week can possess guns and that the Second Amendment applies to them. Yeah, that's insane. Did you see the little clip of all the illegal aliens storming the border down in Texas? Yeah, there's all kinds of videos running around down in Mexico and South America teaching these guys. Like, I didn't see women and children. It was men <laughs> storming the gates. And... Um, yeah, so you have the whole thing of uh, them being taught. You come here and you can take over a house. You just teach. The laws are so dumb in America, and they are. If house is empty. You go in. You're now a squatter. The house is yours. It'll take them forever to get you out. So, yeah, who wouldn't want to come to that? Well, Christian people wouldn't. <laughs> We'd want to do it the right way. But your average person has no problem with that, right? So anyway, yeah, the, the nation is collapsing. If you want to get um, a blueprint of how it's going to continue to go, just read about the fall of Rome, because we've been following that, like, right on T for decades now. And it's going to continue that way as long as man here in America and the West wants to live in rebellion to God. And um, the Lord, Lord's judgment is upon us, and repentance is needed in the land. Amen? Unfortunately, the vast majority of pulpits, the churchmen continue in their indifference, which is so sad to see. Anyway, today I'm actually going to preach through Genesis chapter 3. I know I've been saying that for four weeks now, but it really is going to happen, so pinch yourself if you think you're sleeping, because you're not. I'm going to continue through Genesis today, chapter 3. By the way, there was a film Claire and I watched this week called Is Genesis History? It was really, really good. And there was also a film out for two days in the theaters um, that I had numerous people I know go and see, and they said it was really good. It was Noah in the Dark Waters or something like that? I can't remember. What is it? It's the Ark in the Darkness. The Ark in the Darkness. I was close. Um, so, and I heard that was really good, too. Anyway, since we're going through Genesis, I thought I'd mention those um, two films. Why don't we um, open up to Genesis chapter 3, and I hope you have your saddles on this week, because we're going to be riding for a while on this sermon. And I pray it's a blessing to you. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's word? We're going to read verses 1 through 7. The scripture says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat 
the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of my sermon this morning is The Tempter, The Temptation, The Judgments, and The Justification. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks and praise to you for this time that we have in your word. We ask and pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless it and use it for good in the hearts and minds of all those gathered. Lord, be glorified here. Help me to preach that which you've given me to declare. Build a fire in the hearts of your people because of what's declared here today. A deep desire to serve you in the earth. A deepening of their love for you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Could be seated. And if somebody could let them know out in the hallway that we've started, um, that might be good because I can hear it all the way up here. So I'm going to mention what's like back there. Um, verse 1 starts out and says simply, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of, the, of every tree of the garden. So here we see the tempter. Who is this tempter here in verse 1? This serpent. Why, it's none other than Satan himself. Matthew Henry properly pointed out, quote, It was the devil in the likeness of a serpent. That's right. He went on to say, whether it was only the visible shape and appearance of a serpent, or whatever it was, or whether it was a real living serpent, Actuated and possessed by the devil is not certain. Regardless, the devil chose to act his part in a serpent. The serpent is the devil. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Keep your finger in Genesis 3, because that's where we'll be spending most of our time today. But look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says, so the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 20, verse 2, mark that down for your notes. Revelation 20, verse 2 also says the same thing. The serpent is the devil. The serpent is Satan himself. These first three chapters of Genesis, really the first 11 chapters of Genesis, encapsulates, is tied to, and speaks to most of what follows in the rest of Holy Scripture. That's something I'm going to pound in your head again and again today. These first three chapters, really the first 11 chapters of Genesis, encapsulates, is tied to, and speaks to most of what follows in the rest of Holy Scripture. Who is the tempter here in chapter 3, verse 1? It's Satan himself, that serpent of old, as Revelation says. And Satan has his minions. Satan and his minions have a whole array of means to tempt us. It happens right here at the beginning in Genesis 3, and it's happened throughout the history of mankind ever since. Satan is the tempter of mankind. 2 Corinthians 11 speaks of Satan's quote-unquote devices. Ephesians 6.11 speaks of the devil's quote-unquote wiles. What are wiles? I looked that up myself. It's devious or cunning stratagems employed in manipulating or persuading someone to do what one wants. Devious or cunning stratagems employed in manipulating and persuading someone to do what one wants. Ephesians 6.11 talks about Satan's wiles. Ephesians 6.16 speaks of his fiery darts. Revelation 2.24 speaks of the quote-unquote depths of Satan. 
regarding his evils, his devices. 1 Peter 5.8 exhorts us plainly, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Seeking whom he may devour. Satan is the serpent. Satan is the tempter of man. He is the great enemy of man. And this is why the scriptures address our being tempted and addresses temptations again and again and again throughout Holy Writ. We must be on guard against temptations. And here he is, right at the beginning, Genesis 3, here is Satan tempting man, tempting the first Adam, and we see in the Gospels he would also try to tempt the second Adam, Jesus himself. Correct? Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, mark that down for your notes, says that the tempter came to tempt Christ. And who was it? The devil. He came to tempt Christ. Satan is there tempting the Lord. The first Adam fell to the temptation, as we'll soon see, but Christ, the second Adam, did not. Praise be to God. And look at the nature of the temptation. Remember, the title of the sermon is The Tempter, The Temptation, The Judgments, and The Justification. We've covered who the tempter is. It's that old serpent of old, Satan himself. But let's look at the nature of the temptation, and that's the second part of the sermon. Verses 1 through 4 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice he starts out. Notice the devil starts out here with an outright lie. Did you notice that in verse 1? He starts with an outright lie. He says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he starts with an outright lie, which gets Eve thinking, and which gets Eve talking. Thinking and talking. She corrects the devil in stating that it was only one tree they are not to eat of, not all the trees. She was probably feeling pretty good correcting the devil. But sadly, arrogance is a flower that blossoms in most men. Perhaps that is why he started with an outright lie, to build up her arrogance. It would put down her guard. She would think, this is an underling who doesn't know as much as I do. He would be like Mr. Worldly Wise Man in Pilgrim's Progress. Did you ever notice in all the films you see about that, it's the devil in disguise as Mr. Worldly Wise Man? Trying to get people to doubt the word of God. So she starts out pretty good, but in verse 4, the devil gets to what he's really after. In verses 4 and 5, it says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He wants her to doubt the word of God, to reason with sin, to give credence to temptation. Maybe it's not as bad as it really sounds. Sin is always rooted in two things. A contempt for God's word and the pride of man. Contempt for God's word and the pride of man. Sin is always rooted in those two things. And notice how she responds in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She took of his fruit, and she ate. Compare what takes place here to 1 John 2.16. Again, keep your finger in Genesis 3. Go to 1 John 2.16. The first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 16. The scripture reads, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
Mr. Worldly Wise Man, right? Consider this passage, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, in regards to what happens in the garden in our narrative here in our text in chapter 3 of Genesis. The lust of the flesh took place first off. Is that not true? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she had reasoned God right out of the equation. This was only a matter of food. And this fruit was good fruit, good food. This fruit's good food. Notice also the lust of the eyes. Notice that it says it was pleasant to her eyes. Have you ever seen women at a shopping mall as their eyes see all the things? Yeah, that, that, that fruit looked really good to Eve. There's other things that draw men in that are pleasant to their eyes. The first would be women, the second would be women, and the third would be women. Then sports, then women, 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 then hunting, fishing, then women, women. Yeah, like that. Eve liked the way the fruit looked. She liked what she saw with her eyes. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. So you got the lust of the flesh, you have the lust of the eyes. And then John says, and the pride of life. Notice what it says here in Genesis 3. A tree desirable to make one wise. Again, the arrogance of man, the pride of man, Satan baiting that in her, as I've already mentioned. Sin is always rooted in two things, a contempt for God's word and the pride of man. And so she ate. She ate. As it says here at the end of verse 6, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Notice that Eve said, God said, you shall not eat it, you shall not touch it, lest you die. He actually said, you shall not eat it, lest you die. He never mentioned not touching it. Never did. Maybe she thought, well, nothing happened when I touched it. And that made it easier for her to eat it. My point is simply this, temptation is often incremental. Rarely does someone wake up one morning and say, you know what, I'm going to do adultery today. Yeah, I'm up for adultery today. And just boom, decide. No, there's been a thousand compromises of the mind before that. There's been a thousand little incremental pushes before that, before someone actually goes and commits adultery. Understand? That's how temptation is. Oh, nothing happened when I touched the fruit. I'm good. Oh, God didn't strike me with a bolt of lightning when I was, you know, committing adultery, so it's okay. I keep doing it again. That's how the mind of man works. The end of verse 6 says there that she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Often things can be that it's someone close to us who causes us to fall in temptation. Here it was Adam's wife, Eve. Remember Job's wife did the same? Remember Peter regarding Christ? Christ had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. It's always, it can be at times, I should say, someone close that helps one commit an act of sin. Notice that there was only one law for man. One measly law in the book of Genesis, here in our narrative. And man couldn't even keep that. Does that tell you something about the nature of man? One measly law, couldn't keep it. So it says in verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Okay, so they're no longer innocent, no longer like two-year-olds who didn't care. <laughs> and then the cat and mouse game begins, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said to him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now God knew this. This is the cat and mouse game. For them to see what they have done. To come to grips with it. The conscience of man knows when things are wrong. And if he imbibes upon the sins, his conscience at some point will be seared. And he'll no longer be able to discern good from evil. And that's why it's incredibly important for us to walk holy before the Lord. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, and there's something that's gone on down through history, it's the woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I ate. Adam points to Eve. Like children being caught stealing cookies out of the cookie jar. Stevie was the one who said it was okay to take cookies out of the cookie jar. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done, and what does the woman do? The same thing. Oh, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Man always wants to blame others for his own sin. When the convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, though, you see your sin for what it is, and you see your nakedness, and you realize your only hope is Jesus Christ to obtain forgiveness of sin and right standing with God. So now we come to the judgments. Starting in verse 14, we come to the judgments. The judgment is brought on the serpent, Satan. It is brought on the woman and is brought on the man. All three are judged. Let's start with the serpent. Verses 14 and 15, the scripture reads, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The judgment fell first on the great enemy of man, Satan himself, in the form of the serpent. The serpent from that time forward would remind man of the fall. Isn't that true? You see a snake, reminds you of the fall because of this narrative, because of what happened historically. Snakes, snakes would now have to crawl on their belly. This had to have meant that before they had legs or were upright in some way, the fact that now they've been cursed and they have to crawl on their belly. Some say, well, where are the fossils showing they once had legs? Duh. This was early on, perhaps a few weeks or months into Adam and Eve being in the garden. It was before the flood there would be no fossils. Got a clue. All of creation came under the curse as seen by the term, quote, more than all the cattle and, quote, more than every beast of the field. See that there in verse 14? The fall affected all of creation. This is why Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23, mark that down, Romans 8, verses 19 through 23, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Again, the first three chapters of Genesis encapsulates, is tied to, speaks to most of what follows in Holy Scripture in just these three chapters. Everything that follows in Holy Scripture is found in these three. This is why wicked men, both within the scientific world and the theological world, would have, have tried to undermine and bring doubt about the veracity of the narrative here in these first three chapters really in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And this is seen even again in verse 15. Verse 15 here, which says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
Here is the first reference for the justification of men, of man's redemption through Christ. There would be this great enmity between Satan and man, culminating in the showdown at Calvary. Satan would bruise Jesus' heel. Jesus would bruise Satan's head at Calvary. He would defeat him with a crushing blow at Calvary. As 1 John 3.8 says, mark that down, 1 John 3.8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Now I'll come back to this matter of justification, but first let me continue with the judgments. We still have to get to the woman, we still have to get to the man. Let's go with the woman in verse 16. The scripture says to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So we see two things here. The woman's going to have pain in childbirth. And by the way, I plan on preaching for Mother's Day a sermon on childbirth. Childbearing. Yeah. That's seven weeks from now. Um, so I'm not going to talk much about that. And number two, here we see that the woman's desire shall be to her husband, and he shall rule over you. First, the woman was created to be man's helper. God has made it that her desire, the things she wants to do to get done, which bring her fulfillment, will be to her husband. And he will rule over her, not in some draconian fashion, but in a loving way. This is something seen throughout Scripture and throughout the history of the world, but something has changed due to the fall. The entrance of sin has made that God-given duty and role a punishment or difficulty, which otherwise it would not have been. Matthew Henry properly states, quote, If man had not sinned, he would always have ruled with wisdom and love. And if the woman had not sinned, she would always have obeyed with humility and meekness. And then the dominion would have been no grievance. But our own sin and folly make our yoke heavy. Unquote. The fall brought a change in this relationship. And this is why the feminist movement is a debacle and a joke. It grains against the very created order. So the more the feminists try to invoke this equality, this egalitarian ethic that women can do whatever men do and vice versa, the more chaos grows in the social order. It is re it is rooted in rebellion against God. And it is at war with the very created order of God. Some would say, there you go, Pastor Matt. You want women in the kitchen, barefoot and pregnant. That was a saying popular when I was growing up. You just want women in the kitchen. Bare it was a motto of the feminist movement. And that's how sick they are. Most men would pee on themselves and say, oh, no, I don't believe that. No. No, really, a, a man knows that's how sick they are, that they take this awesome created order of God and reduce it to that and besmirch it with that. It should bother you that they attack the very created order of God for mankind. The kitchen that they're referring to is the ruling part we rule by eating, because men are Neanderthals, you know. Make me sandwich, <laughs> you know. Sugar, more sugar. And by keeping women, women pregnant, the whole childbirth part, they would say we view women as nothing more than baby-making machines. That was another popular term during the feminist movement. And they said things far worse than that. Time Magazine quotes Barbara Ehrenreich, who was a noted feminist back when I was young. She wrote that the family, and she hastened to specify, even the ostensibly functional nonviolent family can be a nest of pathology and a cradle of gruesome violence. For women and children, 
home is statistically speaking the most dangerous place to be. If you've never been to the university and heard these feminists talk and their male cohorts, the effeminized males, it's disturbing. They are at war with God. They hate his word. They hate everything about his created order. And they want to upend it. That, of course, is not true. The home is not the most dangerous place to be. But the state used that kind of rhetoric to invade family government. The state used that kind of rhetoric from the 60s, 70s, and 80s to invade family government. Wicked men have turned everything upside down regarding the word of God and his created order. The woman is no longer her husband's helper. Her desire is not to him, nor is he the head of the home. She now goes out to the workplace to make another man successful. She is now ruled by the state. The husband has been replaced by the state. The state has replaced the husband. She is the state's helper. Her desire is to the state. She respects the state more than her husband. She doesn't have children, as most all are committing familial suicide. She pays taxes to the state so they can show love to her by throwing her some crumbs via her tax dollars. It's disgusting when a woman sits there and says, this is my money, this is his money. It's even more disgusting when a man says, that's her money, this is my money. And yeah, get out of the home and go make some money if you want some money, woman. The state has actually stolen women from men. The state has done it all. The state has done all it can to destroy family in this nation. Do you understand that? Look at abortion, adultery, no-fault divorce, work. Everything that God says about anything, they have made it the exact opposite in this hellhole we live in. This status matriarchal hellhole that we live in, turn everything upside down. And unfortunately, the vast majority of Christians go along with it all. This is all cool. You have no idea how many layers there are to this onion, how many strings are around this softball. <laughs> yes, it's so layers deep. You're living in a place where psychopaths dwell. Look at their laws, look at their policies, look at their court opinions. I see how all these, I see all these videos and threads and articles, people send them to me all the time or I come across them, about how the elitists, you know, the WEF, World Economic Forum, 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 about how the elitists want to take this from you and how they want to make you do that. And I think they've already taken everything from you. Everything that really matters. Because the vast majority of Americans, the vast majority of Christians, live exactly how the leaders want them to live. They do not live as a Christian people. They already have you doing this and that, jumping through their hoops. And you have the ability and decision-making ability to stop it all now. Find a wife, build a family, establish a home. And run it according to Scripture and His created order. That is the counter-revolution to their evil. Demonstrate male responsibility. Serve Him and your family, men, faithfully, with trembling. Matthew Henry points out regarding this judgment on the woman. He says, observe here how mercy is mixed with wrath in this sentence. The woman shall have sorrow, but it shall be in bringing forth children, and the sorrow shall be forgotten for joy that a child is born. And then he actually quotes Christ out of John 16, 21. That's John 16, 21. For those of you taking notes, where Christ says, A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born in the world. Amen? Isn't it funny how these things, the beginning and the first three chapters, are found throughout the rest of Holy Writ? Amen? Even 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 speaks to this matter of childbearing having a redemptive aspect for women. Henry goes on and says, She shall be subject, but it shall be to her own husband that loves her 
not to a stranger or an enemy. I would add, not to the state. (laughs) He says the sentence was not a curse to bring her to ruin, but a chastisement to bring her to repentance. Amen? These are great thoughts by Matthew Henry. If you look up most of this stuff from the churchmen today, you know what they go to on all this stuff? Woke justice. That's what they got. Don't ask my wife, Matuello, walking around the house after he reads one of those psychos. <laughs> I had to do a sermon just on it. Matthew Henry's refreshing. Verses 17 through 19 talks about the role, or pardon me, the judgment on man. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So this is the curse declared upon man. I am going to be doing a sermon on work within the next couple weeks here. It's going to take us a while to get to chapter 4. i got more things about chapter 3 that I want to preach sermons on. But I do want to say a few things about work. Childbirth is innate to the role of the woman, and work is innate to the role of the man. Notice they're both in the curse. One for her, one for him. Because of this passage here that we just read, 17 to 19, many think that work is a curse. They think that work was imposed on man after the fall. They think that prior to the fall, Adam and Eve did not have to work. That they just sat around eating bonbons on the beach and rode horses, had romantic candlelit dinners together, and petted lions. This is not true. They didn't just lay around all day harmonizing with nature like you see in some sort of humanist utopia lithograph. Work was a part of Adam and Eve's life prior to the fall. Remember, we spoke of this briefly in the sermon from chapter 2. Verse 15 says that man was put in the garden to tend it, to work it. Work is innate to men. It's how, in part, we define ourselves as men. My point is, God established work for man prior to the fall. Work is not a curse in and of itself. Rather, I submit to you that work was given to man of God as part of his created order for man. This was the main reason it was so wicked when during the pandemic that government officials were telling men if their work was essential or not, whether they could work or not, and then paying men huge sums of money not to work. Wicked. It was government spitting upon the very great order of God. And that's why this pulpit preached against it. Work is not a curse, but man's work has been cursed subsequent to the fall. The curse here in verses 17 through 19 is a curse upon what? The ground. The ground. Which was a curse upon Adam's work. Remember, this was his work. To tend to the garden. Amen? Amen. But this curse upon man's work, like the curse upon the woman regarding childbearing, has a redemptive aspect to it. Are you listening now? A redemptive aspect to the curse. Notice it says, cursed is the ground for your sake. You see that there? For your sake. The question we need to ask is, how is work being cursed? How is it for our sake? How is work being cursed for our sake? And the answer is simply vanity, futility, vanity. It shows us the vanity of life. Look what it says here in verses 17 through 19. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. And toil is sheet of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles which bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread. So you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, and dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The curse here in verses 17 through 19 is a curse upon the ground. Work helps man see the vanity of life. You work all your life, and then you die. 
You work all your life and then you're, you're dead. Work helps men see their need for God. That there must be something more to life than what I see with my eyes. There must be more to life than, so, than just all this. I go to work for 65 years, get two weeks off for vacation each year. I drive down the same road to go to the same place to do the same work, to come down the same road, eat the same lunchroom, same every... It shows men the vanity of life, that there must be something more to life. This is the redemptive aspect of the curse upon work. It helps men come to grips with the fact there's got to be more to life than what I see with my eyes, than what I just, what this is all about. Now, having completed the judgments, let me complete the chapter and then look further at this matter of justification. Can you tell I wrote that down by how I just read it? Verse 20 says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Wonderful. Verse 21 says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. The second reference to the Trinity. Remember, Genesis 1.26 was the first reference. Has become like one of us, the Godhead, to know good and evil. And now lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore, the Lord God has sent him out of the Garden of Eden to, ki to till the ground from which he was taken. Verse 23 makes clear, God sent man out from the garden to do what? To work. That was a God-given role and function to him for man prior to the fall. And it continues with man. Verse 24 says, So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I believe that it was there until the flood. It's my own personal belief. There is no scripture on there. Just if I had to hypothesize, that's what I would hypothesize. It was probably that way until the flood. The flood, of course, brought massive, massive changes upon earth. Now notice this in verse 21. Notice it says, Adam and his wife, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Tunics of skin, these would be animal skins, to clothe Adam and Eve. Okay, these are probably, you know, pretty coarse-looking things. They weren't made of silk and wonderful linens and all these kinds of things, kind of going along with the whole caveman theme that we see in old caves, how they would dress. Understand their innocence was gone. They knew they were naked. Verses 10 and 11, they knew they were naked. Notice God clothed them. Yes, nudist camps are not of God. Okay, There was a reason Shishka the one-eyed came in and killed the Adamites. They were the nudists of that day. Yes, man has been wicked for a long time. Yeah, ever since, he, ever since the fall, he's very wicked. So Shishka the one-eyed, back in the... 1400s, he was the guy who led the Hussite Wars, rode in and just took out thousands of these Adamites, these depraved people who walked around naked all day and had sex with whoever. We live in such a weird culture now that most people would be like, that was pretty bad of Shishka the one-eyed. You know what I mean? It's like, you know Scotland, this last week, just passed a law for there to be seven years in prison if someone feels that you hate them. And they get to report it to the police and you will be arraigned. Seven years, okay? I wrote on the thing, where's William Wallace when you need him? Where's Shishka the one-eyed when you need him? What an insanity. Their innocence was gone. They knew they were naked. God clothed them, put clothes on them. The clothing also required the shedding of blood of animals. 
The animals had to die to get the skins to put on Adam and Eve. Most all scholars see this as a primal prototype of the shedding of blood for the remission of sins that is found throughout Scripture, culminating in Christ, who was the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Amen? Again, everything here in the first three chapters you see over and over again throughout Holy Writ. Hence the desire of wicked men to make people doubt the validity of this narrative, historically. Because if you're getting out there, you undermine all the rest of Holy Word, of God's Holy Word. This matter of the skins brings us back to the matter of justification. Remember verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy of the coming of Christ who would redeem mankind from their sins and from God's just wrath. Those are the two things you're saved from, your sins and his just wrath. That's what Christ saved you from. When I was young, a popular saying was, Jesus saves. It was so popular that people saved what? They couldn't even tell you. Jesus saved what? Saves you from your sins and his just wrath. Matthew Henry writes of this, quote, a gracious promise is made here of Christ, is here made of Christ, as the deliverer or fallen man from the power of Satan. Though what was said was addressed to the serpent, yet it was said in the hearing of our first parents, who doubtless took the hints of grace here given them and saw a door of hope open to them, Else the following sentence upon themselves would have overwhelmed them. Here was the dawning of the gospel day, unquote. Is that powerful? You remember what the Westminster Catechism says regarding justification, right? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Christ redeemed us through his death and resurrection. He was incarnated as a man, and he triumphed over Satan at Calvary, the great showdown at Calvary that we spoke of earlier. As Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 states, mark it down, Hebrews 2, 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Wow. Here it is in Genesis 3, found throughout Holy Writ, all the way to Revelation, in this case to the book of Hebrews. In Revelation chapter 4, it talks about the 24 elders and how every time the four beasts would do their thing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, they would like take their crowns off and throw them at the throne. What were they saying? I owe everything to you. I owe everything to you. That's what they were saying. You know, we get crowns, right? The crown of life, the crown of righteousness. I think there's like five different crowns Christians can get when you read scripture. I got to believe that's what we're all going to be doing with our crowns too. We just throw all our crowns to him. Why? Because the only reason we have salvation is because of him alone. And the only reason we can do anything good, right, or proper is because of him alone. Amen? That's why we'll throw our crowns there. Let me close by saying these first three chapters, really the first 11 chapters of Genesis, encapsulates, is tied to, and speaks to most of what follows in Holy Scripture, it is massively noticeable. If you can bring doubt to the narrative of Genesis 1 through 11, you can bring doubt to the whole of God's writ. That is why wicked men have tried to bring doubt and disprove the veracity of this narrative that we're going over here in Genesis. They want to bring doubt and disprove the veracity of this narrative of Scripture in these chapters so that men will doubt the word of God in total. May Christ be praised. Let's stand up and close in prayer.
Father, we give thanks and we give praise to you for this time that we have had in your word. We thank you that you've preserved your scriptures so we can know your ways and your thoughts, so we can know these historical facts, this history, revealed in this narrative that we've covered so far in the first three chapters and will continue to do so in the chapters to come. Lord, I ask and pray that you would be glorified what was that you be glorified through what was preached today, that you would use it for good in the hearts and minds of your people, to light a fire within them, to deepen their love for you, to grow their desire to serve you in the earth. God, we need you. We are a needy people. You are the vine. We are the branches. We can do nothing without you. We are utterly dependent upon you, and we look to you to do a great work in our hearts and minds. May you be praised, Lord. May you be praised. God, I ask and pray that each one would do right by you in their office, each man, each woman, each husband, each wife, each father, each mother. May they feel the full weight and gravity and yet the amazing awesomeness of the office you've given them and the duties you've laid at their feet to fulfill. We love you, Lord, and ask that you build your kingdom in our lives and in our homes and in our society. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You could be seated, and we're going to sing a song if we could. Is Timothy still in here? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Could we do Holy, Holy, Holy? Can we do it a cappella? Uh, yeah. Oh, we don't have the hymnals out? Oh, we do have hymnals. You guys got hymnals? What number is that? Does anybody know? Maybe you could just lead us in song for it. Oh, Tom, you want to do that? Okay. All right. 262. 266. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. I'll get out of your way. You can come up. And then we'll do communion after that. I'm going to blast you guys out. Oh, okay. Then just do it there. 266. 262. Oh, there's a 260. Okay. Just a holy, holy for 266. There's three of them for 262. 262. Sorry. Everyone ready? Yes. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, only in the morning our song shall rise. To thee, holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity, holy, holy. Holy, all the saints adore Thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim Falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside Perfect in power, in 
love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Hallelujah. Praise His holy name. Amen. You could be seated. And we're going to take communion at this time, and you can feel free to take communion with us as long as you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion as the Lord's table is only for believers to observe. But if you're a Christian, feel free to partake at the Lord's table here with us. You don't have to be a member of our church or something like that to partake at the Lord's table at Mercy Seat. The Apostle Paul wrote of the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then the apostle says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We're being reminded here of Christ's death at Calvary. The scriptures teach that the wages of sin is death. We should have been put to death for our sins. But God in his mercy sent his son to die in our place. So that if we have faith in him, God forgives us of our sin. And we have right standing with the Father. Amen? Amen. So the writer of the Hebrew calls, Hebrews calls this a great salvation. Okay? So understand, we don't do good works to try and obtain God's acceptance. The good works that we do, they are the result of our saving faith in Christ. There isn't these two elements at his table plus a list of my good works, these two elements plus a list of all my holy deeds, my good living. Just these two elements showing it's through Christ alone whereby God accepts us. The good works that we do, the holy living that we demonstrate, those things are the result of our saving faith in Christ. They're the evidence or the fruit of our saving faith in Christ. We don't do those things to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do them because we have obtained his acceptance. Amen? And there was an entire reformation that took place 500 years ago over that precise point within the church. May Christ be praised. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have at your table. We thank you for the redemption that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we know you, that we're no longer in the dark, feeling our way down a hallway with no lights lit, we thank you that we've been translated into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your dear Son, Father. And we ask and pray, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified now as we take this time to observe your table, as your people have for 2,000 years now. Lord, we ask and pray that you would be glorified through our lives this coming week, that we would make your law, your word, and this great salvation known to men not hiding it under a bushel, but putting it on a candlestick and making it known to men. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Let's stand up and we'll close in a word of prayer.
Father, again, we thank you for this time in the book of Genesis, that you preserved your word. And again, we thank you that we can gather with the saints and have this time of instruction, equipping, so that each one may go from these doors and do the work of the ministry out in the marketplace and in their homes. And Lord, we just ask and pray that you help each man to be a priest to his home, that he would take time this week to open your word to his wife and to his children and for them to talk about the things of you. Lord, we ask and pray that each woman would be a helpmate to her husband, an anchor in the home, a nurturer of the children. Lord, we just ask and pray that each child would love you, would live in obedience to you, in obedience to their parents, Father, that you build your kingdom within each one of their hearts and lives, that by the power of your spirit they come to know you at a young age. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for your goodness to us. We ask and pray that you keep our hearts hungry for you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. May Christ be praised.